We're ready to continue our study of the book of Philippians tonight. We actually are still in verse 1. We're ready for question number 17 on verse 1. By the way, one of the things that I hope you're picking up on is uh, when I prepare to teach a lesson, I ask the lesson I want to teach every question I can think of. And so when I read verse 1, I came up with uh, 27 questions on that one verse. And uh, so I just do this with every verse all the way through the Bible. And some of them, there are not many questions I need to ask. And some of them are questions. I know the answer. It's very clear. Others make me think. I don't really know. And that helps me in discerning to make a distinction between what my opinion is and what the Bible actually says. But uh, I, I don't know what works for you, but uh, this is the methodology that has been a blessing to me. And so uh, I just want you to know that uh, there's a reason why I'm doing this. I have no <coughs> idea what uh, may be in the mind of people while we're uh, discussing this, but I'm going to try to cover all the bases before we actually finish any one verse, and even then there will be additional questions, and that's fine. I want you to ask the questions, and I want you to feel free to share any thoughts that you want along the way. Let's bow our head in prayer, please. Father in heaven, I thank you for the Bible, the book that uh, is your book, that sets a standard for what we are to believe, and how are we to behave, and therefore knowing that our eternity is determined by what you are telling us in your word. Please help us to understand it right. Please put a big stumbling block in our way to keep us from going in the wrong direction. And please put a big stepping stone in our path to encourage us as we try to go the right direction. We want to know you more perfectly. We want to follow you more carefully. We want to show our gratitude in the way in which we live from day to day. And most of all, we want to live knowing that everything you've done for us has not been in vain, but for our benefit. And so may our day-by-day -day lifestyle be kind of an expression of saying thank you in words, in actions, in attitudes. And God, I know that we fail you. Oftentimes we're not as grateful as we ought to be. Forgive us, please. But encourage us toward what is right tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would somebody like to read verse 1 for us? So that's so we can see what we're talking about. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Thank you. Now, in verse uh, question number 17, are there any ethical implications involved in the word saints? What's your answer? No. no. In other words, to be called saint doesn't encourage us one way or the other to be good or bad. It yes. doesn't? Yeah. I, would, I would feel a little pressure, a little, little peer pressure, a little, little... Then you disagree with the answer I just got. They said no. And you're saying And I'm yes. saying yes. I think there are ethical implications, but that's Thank just you. me. I agree with you. So let's stand together against all these people that don't agree. just me. just me. We all changed our minds. <laughs> you change your minds pretty quickly. So uh, yes. The answer is yes. You know. Did you call me Saint? I want to live up to that. Oh, I sure. Saint Sarah. It's unfortunate that uh, in our day, we think the word saint belongs only to somebody who's dead or almost dead. Or at least while they're living, they have white hair. And, uh, you know, you may be living and have white hair and be a saint. But you can be pretty young and have the blackest hair there is and be equally a saint. A saint is one who is working out sanctification. 
Sanctification is working out godliness, holiness. The reason we don't call each other saints any more than we do, I think, is because deep down inside we realize that word saint kind of puts some pressure on us. And we're not sure that we really measure up. But I would suggest that the word saint puts no more pressure on me than the word Christian. The word Christian means I'm a follower of Christ. Now, does my life indicate that he's the one I'm really following? Or does it indicate that I kind of ignore him? And I kind of go my own way and do my own thing? So, I think the word ethical means doing what's right. And I think that this is a word that carries with it the concept of doing what's right as God would tell us. Number 18, would the Christians in Philippi be clearly identified by the public as the people of God? I would think so because he's referring to them as saints. Yeah, I think so too. I think that's what's implied in what he's saying here in verse 1 by the very fact that he identifies them as saints. Now, does that indicate today that it should not take you a long time to be with somebody before you learn whether or not they're a Christian? That's right. Uh, saintliness ought to be easily identified by every one of us who are Christians. Now, you know, if I can be with a person for an extended period of time and they still can't figure out whether or not I'm a Christian or not, that's not being very complimentary to me. And if what they're saying is true, then I sure need to work hard at bringing about some changes in my life. Uh, does that make sense to you? Yes. Perfect. Doesn't it seem to me, uh, does it seem to you that there are a lot of people that call themselves Christians and you're kind of taken back when you first realize that? Because you've known them for a long time? You call yourself a Christian? By the way, what's your basis for calling yourself that? That's interesting, you see. Okay, uh, number 19. What made the Philippian saints special in their community? Mm -hmm. oh, whoops. Mm -hmm. Number 19. 19? You don't have a number 19? It doesn't say that. <laughs> Can one be a saint without being in Christ Jesus? Oh, is that right? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll deal with that question. <laughs> Uh, and what's the answer to that question? No. 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 Okay, what's your next question? Other New Testament writers, blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> Mine starts out that way. It just seems out the word blah. So no. let me use my version for number 20. I'm glad you told me about that 19. I got, I'm sorry about that. Other New Testament writers rarely use the phrase in Christ. Paul uses it frequently throughout his writings. What does in Christ mean as Paul uses the term? Belonging to Christ? Yes, and what else? I'm Being sorry? Being a Christian. Living like Being a Christian? Living the right kind of life? I think the term in Christ indicates that explains the way I live. That explains why I'm who I am. Because I would not be this way by myself. I would not be this way without Christ. In fact, it's only in Christ that I have the real model standard to live by. It's only in Christ that I can face the future with hope and optimism. It's only in Christ that I don't have to fear death. It's only in Christ that you explain what I believe, what I behave, all there is about me. So it's not anything to my credit. So I don't go around saying to either, each one of you, and you don't come around saying to me, my, what a good person you are. No, what a great God you have. And by the grace of God, we are what we are. Is that not true? Oh, yeah. What Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Not because of anything that he accomplished, but what he was willing for Christ to accomplish through him by he himself being in Christ, having that personal relationship with Christ, we are part of his body. Number 21, what is unique about the expression including the overseers and deacons? 
the only time you see it in his writings. That's exactly right. And this is significant. And by the way, this is how we can be certain that not everybody in the church is an elder. Not everybody in the church is a deacon. Now, there are a lot of people that are not elders that you'd almost think we're elders because they're trying to run things. And there are a lot of people that say, well, I'm a deacon. And in a sense, I would hope that every one of you here tonight in the church is either a deacon or a deaconess. In the generic sense. That is, in the sense that you are working for the Lord. A deacon is somebody who's serving his fellow man. And that's the responsibility of every one of us. However, even though that's our responsibility, there's a, a phrase perhaps you've heard. Everybody's job is nobody's job. Is that not true? <clears throat> now, when we come to the service on the Lord's Day morning, uh, there's somebody at the door to greet us. At least there has been for me. They always give me a smile and a handshake. And uh, they hand me something. And there's usually two sheets of paper that I get. One's on a little stiffer paper. And that kind of gives me the schedule of the week's activities. And the other tells me what the preacher's going to be preaching about and helping to guide me and taking notes on his sermon. And are you with me so far? <laughs> All right. Now, how are these people that stand at the door and hand these papers out to us able to do that? Well, somebody just volunteered to print it this week. Who was it? I don't know. Suppose we did that on a free will basis. And all is said, I hope somebody will volunteer to do this next week. And so I get to thinking, well, I guess it's my turn. But I really don't feel like I'm up to it this week. My schedule isn't allowed, so I'm going to put it off. And I just assume somebody else is going to do it. Will it be done? Maybe. Maybe not. Is it not true that most jobs that get done are because they're assigned? Mm -hmm. And people assume that responsibility. Now... There are certain things in the church that need to be done. When you're studying the book of Acts, you'll remember that the widow, the Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of the foods and things that they needed to sustain their lives. And they appointed men whom we think were deacons. In other words, they put seven men in charge of this. Because anybody's job or everybody's job is nobody's job. When we say, you seven men have this obligation, this is your responsibility, then we can assume it's going to be done. So that's the way it is in the church. God does not assume that we're all going to boss everybody else. No, he assumes that there are going to be some people that are going to be our leaders. They're going to be the ones that are kind of supervising and superintending. And then there are others that are going to make sure that if there's a plumbing problem, we're going to take care of it. If there's an electric problem, we're going to take care of it. I didn't have those problems in the early church, but they had other issues. But uh, we have, many times, we have the number of deacons we have, depending upon the size of the congregation and the various things that need to be done. So to make sure that these both these areas are covered, the early church then had elders and deacons. Now, because that is the pattern, I think that every church ought to have elders and deacons. Now, some don't. In fact, uh, I filled in for a church that did not have any elders. And that bothered me. The thing that bothered me the most is no man even wanted to be an elder. Now, you stop and think about this. Uh, the Bible speaks in other passages that uh, if anyone desires to serve as an elder, that's a great desire. That's a good desire to have. And I think, why wouldn't a person look forward to gaining that spiritual stature so they'd want to be used as God's servant. It's a privilege to serve God in the way in which he's talented us. Now, not everybody has leadership skills. Not everybody has organizational skills. I recognize that. But uh, anyhow, this is, uh, makes it clear that there were uh, distinctive people in the church at that time called overseers and deacons. Now, did I take number 22? No, 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 no. Are the terms overseers and deacons mentioned in such a way as to distinguish them from the rest of the congregation? Yes. yes. Yes, they are. Now, what is the significance of the overseers and deacons that they're both in the plural form? Yes. 
And I think it's important to follow that pattern today, particularly with the overseers. Suppose you only had one person serving as an elder. What would the temptation be? Control. Control. Dictator. No accountability. There is safety in numbers. And no one person is able to do everything. We're talented in a variety of areas. And by the way, I personally think that it's not wise for a preacher to be an elder. Now, I know that uh, in recent years that's become popular in a number of churches. And sometimes it uh, happens in a church because there's only one man willing to serve as an elder, and they know that to have elders, you have to have at least two, you have to have plurality. So the preacher says, well, I'll volunteer to be one if you want me to. And they said, yeah, we do. At least they're... But uh, that's kind of sad. I, I personally think that the elder is not over the preacher and the preacher is not over the elder. They are two separate functions. They both need each other. In fact, all of us need each other. If you don't believe that, just read again 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians where he likens the body of believers to the physical body. Can my hand say to my feet, I don't need you? Can my eyes say to my ears, I don't need you? We need each other. I need you. Your presence here tonight means more to me than most of you will ever realize. And I've not made an exaggeration. That would be a lie. I'm up here telling you the truth. We mean things to people sometimes, and we're not even aware of it. And we need to realize sometimes it's your presence that was the most encouraging factor in the entire assembly on this particular occasion. And that can vary from one person to another. But people need people. And they need encouragement. And they need role models. Now, number 24, does the phrase overseers and deacons suggest that there was some kind of organization in the Church of Philippi? Yes. Very definitely. Number 25, what is the role of overseer? All right, they're overseeing, uh, looking over, superintending, uh, supervising, uh, protecting, managing. It's not, it's not a being a boss. It's not being a CEO. It's more like being a dad in the family, concerned about the well-being of the family. And so the idea of just simply making sure that everyone's feeling good and they're all believing correctly and they're having their problems met and their needs met and they're growing in the right direction. Number 26, what is the role of deacon? Same as an overseer. No, it's not the same. It's a service role. And service can be anything. Uh, very humble. Uh, and it's interesting that, uh, you know, Roger, are you a deacon? I assumed that he was, but I wanted to make sure. But what would give me my first clue when I come to church on Sunday morning? He's out there, He's out there greeting me. How many others in this church are out there in the parking lot, sometimes when it's kind of cold, just waiting to give you a warm welcome? None of them. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's wonderful. I remember when I first talked to an elder of one of the large churches in Fort Myers, Florida, a number of years ago. Uh, one of their deacons stands in the parking lot because they have multiple services and they have to direct traffic and sometimes getting in and out is not easy. Now, if you had a church of only 15 or 20 people, would you need a deacon for that? No. I don't think so. <laughs> so it's going to vary. In other words, there are different responsibilities, different opportunities, and different situations. Number 27, why is special mention made of overseers and deacons? And the reason I ask that question is to simply say, Bible doesn't say. There are no answers given. Now, um, but the one thing that is evident, Paul is aware that in the church there are two groups of people. One group is called elders and the other group is called deacons. All right, verse 2, please. Grace to you and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Were grace and peace commonly used words and greetings in the New Testament days? Yes, they were. And you can notice this as you read through the New Testament. What is the meaning of the word grace? A gift. 
It's a gift. What kind of a gift? Non-deserved. 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 That's right. It's unmerited favor. It's something you don't deserve, but God gives it to you in a way that nobody else can give it to you and gives you something that nobody else is in a position to give to you. Now, number two, three, what word describes the result of being reconciled, that is, being in right relationship with God? What word describes that? Peace. That's right. So he's talking about how God is good to you, and because you've received his goodness in a right way, you enjoy a right relationship with God. Don't you wonder how a person who's not a Christian is able to face some of the difficulties they face in life? Yes. And isn't it wonderful that we have the power of prayer? And isn't it wonderful that God promises he'll never leave us or forsake us? He's always there to help us. And to know that he's in control and that all history underscores this fact, uh, that gives us peace, uh, a serenity, a calmness, the way that God wants us to be. Number four, in what way does Paul elevate grace and peace in his greeting? From God. That's right. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to address Jesus as Lord? He is. He is Lord. And what does that mean? That's right. So he is on a par with God. He is Lord. Lord is used both of God and of Christ. And sometimes it's difficult to tell which one is meant. And maybe it means both. But sometimes it's used of God. Sometimes it's used of Christ. Sometimes it's used of both of them together. Jesus uh, on one occasion said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you to do? So we identify him as Lord only when we are doing what he asks us to to do. Number six, in what part of the Philippian letter does Paul underscore the Lordship of Christ? Chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. That is a prize scripture. Really, really important. Um, that's a passage of scripture that says, the day is coming that every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means even those who have not made him Lord are going to have to confess that he is the Lord even though he's not their Lord because they rejected him. That's, that's significant. So all those who reject God, reject Christ, before it's all over with, will have to admit that they are wrong. They'll have to admit who God is, who Jesus is. Verse 3. I thank God in all my remembrance of you. All right. I like duets, so if there's two or three of <laughs> them, Speak together. <laughs> How is intimacy expressed in this verse? My God. My God, right. Showing obviously a very close relationship. Now we talked about this last week. Paul identifies Timothy as in his first verse, but we know that Paul is really the one who writes this because of these personal pronouns. I thank my God in all my, that's personal, remembrance of you. Now, does this verse suggest that the prayer is a very personal expression of Paul's? Yes. Yes. yes, it is. It's not something he was taught to pray by his parents when he was a child. This is something that's very real in his own heart and mind. Number three, what's another possible grammatically correct way of interpreting the phrase, my remembrance of you? The other equally possible way to translate this would be, your remembrance of me. Now, you can understand this either way. Now, I think the way we've read it here uh, in the New American Standard, my remembrance of you, I think that's correct. But uh, technically, grammatically, they could have said, your remembrance of me. And, of course, Paul knew that they remembered him because they're the ones that supplied help. They're the ones that supplied, uh, supplied the Epaphroditus who came while he was in prison to minister to his needs and to help him in any way that they can. Now, number four, in all my remembrance may refer to Paul's custom to pray regularly at appointed times for prayer as was Jewish custom. If in all speaks of his regular prayer life, then which phrase best fits, in remembrance of you or in remembrance of me? In remembrance of you. I think that best fits right. Now, folks, let me say this, and I, I really mean this. When you come to phrases like this, and we've done this before, and I'll try to point them out as we come to them from time to time. When you come to a phrase that can be translated two different ways, it occurs to me 
that maybe God intended that you should look at it both ways. At least see if it would work correctly both ways. In this place, it would work and be honest in both ways. But there's something that tilts toward the fact that Paul is really talking about his remembrance of the people. Verse 4. Always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Thank you. Do verses 3 and 4 suggest that the Philippians were on Paul's prayer list? Yes. 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 It certainly does. Number 2. If, if there were any divisions in the church in Philippi, what suggests that Paul did not take sides? All of you. Notice, my prayer for all of you. Number three, is joy, is the joy theme dominant in this letter? Yes, yes it is. We've talked about that before. Five times it's used as a noun, and uh, 11 times it's used as a verb. So you're going to, this is only four chapters, but you're going to see this word either as a noun or a verb several times in this letter. Number four, what makes Paul's reference to joy so significant in this letter? I'm sorry? He's in prison. That's right. I mean, here's a guy. He's chained to a soldier. They're keeping him in custody. And he's going to be there for two years. So he's really penned up. Now, people can come and visit him. He just can't go where they are, but they can come where he is. But he is always chained next to a soldier. Can you not imagine how much of the gospel that soldier that he's chained to is going to get? No wonder some of them became Christians. He'll allude to that later on. I wonder how much he prayed just sitting there in jail. Oh, yeah. And crazy. think what it would mean to the soldier to just hear him pray. <laughs> Who are these people you're talking about? You know, that's got to sink in a little bit, I would think. Number five, at what point in this chapter do the contents of this prayer begin? Verse nine is the answer. That's where you're going to find the beginning of the prayer, so we're going to come to it. Now, number six, what is significant about the fact that the word prayer is not Paul's usual word? In other words, he says, always offering prayer. Now, there's one word. I won't give you the Greek because you won't remember it anyhow. <laughs> Neither will I. But uh, there, are, there is more than one word in the Greek language that we properly translate as prayer. And the common word for prayer includes praise, thanksgiving, petition, intercession, confession. All these things are in part of the word generally used for prayer. The word he uses here refers only to my request on your behalf. In other words, I want to ask you for something. So he's emphasizing that part of it. So uh, he realizes that uh, there are some needs that they have, there are some requests that they need to have met, and he's praying in that regard. Number seven, what does it mean to pray with joy. Remember this, joy is what we have as a result of being in the right relationship with God. The difference between joy and happiness is this. Happiness is determined by what did or did not happen. Now you can usually tell the difference between joy and happiness by watching a person over a period of time. Have you ever known a person close enough and with them often enough to sense that they're on a roller coaster? That they're a yo-yo? Up one day, down the next? Up and down, up and down? They may be happy, but if they're up, it's because of what happened. Or they're up maybe because of what didn't happen. And they're glad it didn't happen. The word joy describes the person who is always at peace, who is always optimistic, who is always hopeful, because they know that on the bad days, when the world caves in on them, when it looks like everyone has forgotten them, they know the Lord is always there. They never forget, my Father is in heaven, and He's watching over me, and He's taking care of me. And that's what helps keep the Christian going. The constant companionship we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I like to really emphasize joy as that which we experience because 
we have a right relationship with God. We are his children, and we know it, and we enjoy the blessings of being his children. Verse 5. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. All right. Now, what word in this verse is a favorite of Paul's in view of the fact that he uses it more than any other New Testament writer? Gospel. Well, in this particular case, it's the word participation. Now, in some of your versions, you may have the word partaker, uh, sharing together, uh, but he uses this. It's in the New Testament 19 times. He uses them 13 times himself. So he constantly sees, you know, we're in, we're in this together. We have a relationship with each other. We're bound together. We love each other. We help one another. We're concerned for one another. Uh, this is what he recognizes. So he says, you are just as concerned about getting the good news out to other people as I am. And we're working together. I'm working here in prison with the soldiers taking care of me. They're my mission field right now. You're working there in Philippi. But we are participating. We are sharing. We're partnering in the gospel, getting the good news out to others. Now, number two, though the term uh, participation may have a wide variety of meanings, what is obvious about its meaning as used in this letter? Yes, and particularly in this letter, it was their sending of a gift through Epaphroditus to meet his personal needs. And that's the way he knew, hey, you're in partnership with me. Now, when we work with somebody and the person we're working with has a need, Aren't we usually the first ones that want to help meet that need? Aren't we the ones that are concerned about them? And so, uh, obviously, they're sharing and living the Christian life. They're sharing and spreading the gospel. But they're, they're sharing his witness, sharing with him the gospel by taking care of his needs so he can keep on keeping on in the Lord's work. Now, Paul uses the term gospel approximately 60 of the 76 times it appears in the New Testament. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Now, folks, <clears throat> the simplest, most concise definition of gospel is contained in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's it in a nutshell. That's the heart of what we're saying. Is it important for us to realize Jesus died? Yes. Why did he die? He was a perfect man. Why did he die? For our, For our sins. What is so significant about the death? death. Verifies that... The, uh, <clears throat> I, I meant to say what's so significant about the burial. Oh. The burial verifies the death, does it not? Yes. yes. And it underscores the resurrection. Death is the worst that Satan can bring on man. He pulls out all stops. And the only thing that explains the death of Christ is your sin and mine, our sins. But he conquered that. And that's the good news. The good news, he died my death, and he's risen to give me a hope and proving that the power of God is far greater than the power of the evil one. Number four, what is significant about the fact that the gospel appears so often in the writings of Paul without any modifiers. You just said it. All right. They know it really well, don't they? Yeah. It's such a commonly used term, and they understand it so well, it doesn't have to go on ahead and describe it in any further way. They know instantly what he's talking about. Now, what is meant by the first day? Your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. What's he really saying with that phrase? They received it. Yeah. From the time you became a Christian and you're living the Christian until you die as a Christian. All this time, you are remaining faithful in living the Christian life and sharing that with other people and working with Paul in the process. Number six, would it be correct to say that the phrase from the first day until now suggests the constant loyalty of the Philippian saints to the gospel? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Verse six, please. <clears throat> For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. All right, what's the basis of Paul's confidence? God. If I have confidence in you, what's another word I could use? Trust. Trust, faith. Yeah, I think behind all this is faith. Not only in the Philippians, but also in God. And God's working things out through them. 
So I think that his faith in God and the power of the gospel to change lives and to get people committed to him, I think that's the basis of his confidence. And he wants to encourage that because he believes that as long as they remain faithful to God, things are going to get better. They're going to enlist more people to become Christians. Number two, what part does confidence play in the letter to the Philippians? Well, it's kind of like the word joy. His confidence shines through all the way through. By the way, do you enjoy, when you're talking about serious issues, talking to somebody who can talk with you with confidence? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I think particularly when you're talking to people about their relationship with the Lord, uh, you, you kind of want to uh, not say, well, I, I, I really think this is right. I, I, I really hope that it is. Uh, well, you know, no. We want to talk to somebody who says, hey, this is right. This is not something you can argue about. Read it. This is what God says. It's written in black and white. And folks, we need, to, I'm afraid that one of our big problems in the church today is we've not really respected God's word. There's so many issues in almost every avenue of life where God has clearly spoken. And we don't want to accept it. So we just kind of, oh yeah, I've read that. And kind of gloss over it, not really paying close attention to it. I think confidence is something that Paul wants all of his readers to have. And certainly these people here. And he certainly is exemplifying in his own life. He, he's taken his life on the fact that what God has said is right. And he just is not entertaining any possibility of a mistake in anything that God has said. Now, what does Paul call that which God started in the church in Philippi? Good work. A good work, right. Now, what is this good work Paul writes of in this verse? Their knowledge of the word. Yeah, and their participation in the gospel. They're sharing together. So this is good that we work together, that we encourage one another. Number five, is this good work something the Philippians can take credit for? No. Not really. This is what God is doing through them. It, they're just simply spreading the gospel. But the gospel is what's changing lives. It's a message that really gets through that does the job. The gospel is the power of God and salvation. Now, what is meant by in you will perfect it? The word perfect, uh, perfect, uh, means complete. Uh, it's a Greek word, teleos. Uh, let me say it this way. Can you get in an airplane and go from point A to point B if there is absolutely nothing in your way and there's a runway connecting point A to point B? Can you get in an airplane and go from point A to point B without ever getting off the ground? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. But that's not what airplanes are made for. So it would not be teleos. In other words, it would not be perfect. The word perfect means accomplish what you are made for. Complete what the job was that was given to you. So when he's talking about in you, uh, God will perfect it. God works through his church. He fulfills his the purpose, his plan in the church, doing what God wants him to do. So... Uh, he is encouraging them. He's, he's the great encourager in all that he's writing here. So he said, I'm confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will bring it to uh, completion. That as long as you're living, God's will is getting done. His plan is unfolding in and through you. Now folks, we're not going to live forever. But during our lifetime, one of the nicest things to be said about any one of us is to say, you know, God was using me to help fulfill his plan for my fellow man and the world I live in. One generation leaves, another generation comes along, and they pick up and continue the same cycle. Now, what is the day of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? And salvation is part of the completion. Yeah, obviously a reference to the return of the Lord, but uh, do you realize that uh, humanly speaking, the church 
could go into extinction at the end of every, every generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at a letter that I received, oh, probably 15 years ago, from a girl who was a teenager when I was preschool. And I remembered her because her dad was my Sunday school teacher when I was junior high. And he had me sit next to him because every time I wasn't paying attention, boy, did he squeeze. And he could squeeze hard. And, oh, Tom Rogers, I'll never forget him. As long as I uh, you know, we boys sat around the table, but I think my dad must have told him, now you make sure Glenn sits next to you. And, uh, but anyhow, Barbara was his daughter. And uh, she, after she got out of high school, married Gaylord, um, Gaylord, huh, can't think of his last name now. But anyhow, uh, I wrote a letter back to Alma, Nebraska. That's a church that ordained me when I finished Bible college. And I just wanted to find out, how are things going in my home church? And uh, she's the one on behalf of the church, I didn't know who to write it to, but she was the one that uh, answered the letter and said, uh, oh, well, hearing from you brings back uh, the good old days. And she then told me about all the good things that happened as a teenager growing up in the church when her parents were still living. But she said, I have some sad news to report to you. She said, we're just barely existing. We're just barely existing. And I thought, what a shame. What a shame. But that kind of thing happens. In fact, communities go out of existence, don't they? In fact, this church at Philippi, there is no Philippi today. There are extensive ruins over there. When I visited Philippi, I was not able to go into some of the area where the old city was because they were still working in excavation and they didn't want anything to interfere as they try to uncover evidence of what was once here back in the days when it was actually a city. But as long as we live, we need to live in anticipation of the Lord's return and make sure the gospel is spread. So what is being said here uh, refers to all of us in our own lifetime. And as they were looking forward to the coming of Christ, so we ought to be looking forward to the coming of Christ. That motivates us in what we do. Number eight, in view of the fact that accompanying the return of Christ is the day of judgment, does Paul say anything about how the Philippian Christians will fare on the day of judgment? They're working to perfect it. Yeah, I think he says, hey, look forward to the day of judgment. You're going to see the stamp good on that day, as long as you continue doing what you do. In other words, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ, the day you have to give an accounting. And we will give an accounting. And let him look to you and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, let me make you ruler now over many things. That's the day we look forward to, and that's the day he's encouraging Philippians to look forward to. Verse 7, please. Ooh, can you ask number nine? nine? You have question number 9? Yeah. 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 Does this verse teach once saved, always saved? All right, what's the answer to that? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I gave you questions I don't have. <laughs> trip us up. <laughs> I really do know it's a case of where every time I teach a class, I always go over my work and redo it and I've got my own notes scribbled all over I'm going to have to retype it now but I'm glad to get this straight now thank you number verse 7 for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel you are all partakers of grace with me thank you now what words in this verse may suggest to some that Paul is being defensive Right for me to feel yeah, that. it's only right for me. Like somebody's saying, you can't do this. And he's saying, yes, I can. It's only right for me. Uh, it may sound like uh, uh, Paul was being criticized for his prayers, but uh, that's really not what it is. What is probably the meaning of it is only right? I think he's saying, uh, this is my obligation. What I'm doing, it's right for me to feel toward you like I do. Because you're doing so well, and I want to encourage you. And I'm glad that we're partners together. So, 
Is it right for us to encourage one another? Yes. Should we share our feelings with one another? Yes. It's so helpful to know that uh, others go through the same experiences we do and we can be helpful to them in that time. Number three, what word in verse seven appears to be another one of Paul's favorite words by the number of times uh, he uses it compared to its use elsewhere in the New Testament? It's the word feel. The word feel. Uh, 26 times in the New Testament. 23 of these times is Paul using that term. Uh, now, uh, 23 of these times are in this particular letter that we're talking about. So he's going to talk about that quite a bit. Now, the word feel carries with the idea, this is the way I really think about you. This is uh, my opinion. This is uh, my concern that I have for you. Now, what thoughts are expressed with the word feel? Uh, I would say, when you feel something, you're simply saying, this is my opinion, uh, this is my concern, this is what I really think. Uh, it's uh, the thoughts and the concerns, or the questions, or the doubts that we entertain. That's, I think all of us understand what we mean by the word feel. By the way, our salvation is not determined how you feel. It's good for us to have feelings to one another. That encourages the right relationship with each other. But the word feel is not because of what I feel, it's because of what God says. I can't tell you the number of times in my preaching in multitudes of churches and sat in Sunday school classes, the teacher would say, how do you feel about this verse? And I think, I don't care how you feel about this. All I want to know is, what's God saying? Your opinion may or may not be right, but what is God saying? And, you know, sure we share our feelings, and that's fine. But the bottom line is, what is God actually saying? Now, what's the significance of all of you? No one's excluded. That's right. Paul is not playing any favorites here. He's not pitting one group against another in the church. Uh, everyone in the church he has feelings toward. How is the rightness of Paul's feelings explained in this verse? Where does he have his feelings? In his heart. In my heart. You're in my heart. You're in my thoughts. I pray for you. I'm concerned for you. You know, I was really caught off guard a number of years ago when a friend of mine whose sister was a missionary in India told me one day, he said, uh, I don't think you have any way of knowing this, but I remember you by name every day in my prayers. Wow. That was a humbling thing for me to hear. Uh, I remember John Chase, missionary to Korea, years ago was speaking uh, at the church where my father was a minister, and he indicated that when he had come back on furlough to report how things were going in the evangelism around Seoul, Korea, he said he ran across one gentleman that told him, he said, John, every day since the time I saw you before and you were here, I've taken you to God in prayer. And John said, obviously, that accounts for anything good that we've accomplished because God is in it and somebody is calling upon God's help. Wonderful thing to have other people in our hearts, and we should. Now, what is the difference between defense and confirmation of the gospel? Well, you can defend it because you're positive that it's the Word of God. Yeah, the, the words really need to be considered together. He only he doesn't say the defense and the confirmation. He says the defense and confirmation. One article for both words. So uh, I think that this is all a part of one experience. In other words, Paul realizes that uh, what he's saying is true and it's going to be proven as true by what he does. Now, number nine, in what different ways may defense and confirmation of the gospel be understood? Uh, I think the easiest way to explain this is the way that Jesus explained it. I know we talked about this last week, but also the way that Paul's explaining it here. How did an apostle establish himself as an apostle to those who are hearing him for the first time? Miracles. That's right, miracles. That was unique to the first century. But that confirmed 
Now, what they were saying was true. Now, what Paul says by defense is, hey, my record stands for itself. Anybody who's there and tells the truth will say exactly what I've been saying. God is my witness. And he has confirmed this. And the fact that I'm telling you the truth is verified by the fact that God through me is accomplishing things that he could not do through you. Unless you were given these miraculous spiritual gifts. All right, uh, verse 10, please. Am I right? Eight. Verse 8, I'm sorry. I was looking right at it. You have question number 10, don't you? Yes. 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 Uh, that's what I'm looking at. Okay. In what way were the Philippians able to be partakers of the grace with Paul? I think through their prayer life. Though they were miles apart, each one is praying for the other. And they're both praying for the same thing, that they encourage one another, that they all be involved in the spreading of the gospel and properly represent Christ by the way in which they're living. Verse 8. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Does Paul continue to express his deep attachment to his readers in this verse? Yes. Yes, he does. Uh, you know, he just wants to make sure that they understand this. What's the meaning of with the affection of Christ Jesus? Do you ever get the feeling that when a person says, I love you, they may love you on one plane, but it's not the same kind of a plane that Christ loves you? Yeah. And I think that he's saying here, I, I love you as Christ would love you. And what's that saying about the love of Christ? Christ loves us not because of a personal relationship, though that's a part of it, and not because we're smart or not smart or good looking or ugly. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with it. Though it does with human relationships many times. But the word love is the word agape, which means I love you to the extent that I want the very best for you. And I'm trying to bring the best out of you. So that's real Christian love, folks. And we can love each other on the physical plane. And we can love each other on the family plane. And that's all good. But there is no greater love than to love each other from the standpoint of Everything I do for you, I do because I want you to be better than you are. Meaning, I want you to be as much like Christ as you possibly can be. And to love a person with that object in mind is the thing that he's talking about with the affection of Christ Jesus. Elsewhere he's going to say, have this mind in you which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul's saying here. I want to have the same kind of love he had for me. And that's the kind of love I think I have for you. Now, why does Paul employ the oath, God is my witness? Because he's the only one that can witness this. Is that not true? I mean, you can tell me you feel one way, and I can either accept you as telling me the truth or trying to fool me. But do I really know? No, I can have real strong thoughts. I can think that I know, but the final reality is, I do not know what's behind your motive, Accept what you tell me, and I want to believe the best. But with God, He knows. He knows. And that's so important. And Paul knows when he takes an oath that God is my witness, that uh, he is really wanting them to understand how serious he regards their correct understanding of his attitude toward them. God knows I'm not just saying something to flatter you. God knows I'm saying this because this is really true. When Paul writes, I long for all of you, he uses the word long, which he uses seven of the nine times that it appears in the New Testament. It's a strong word. What is Paul longing for in this verse? To be with them? Or? Yeah, he would love to be with them. And whether he's with them or not, he certainly wants to help them and encourage them in any way that he can. This longing is a yearning. It's an intense desire to be uh, present with them and to help them in any way he can. Oh, my. That's wonderful, isn't it? What a relationship Paul had with the people that he led to Christ. Number five, would it be fair to say that Paul loves the Philippians as Christ does? Yes. Well, I think so. In fact, I think that...
Christ is showing his love for the Philippians through men like the Apostle Paul. Just like I think Christ is showing his love for people that we know through us. And we need to keep that in mind. Verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. We now come to the prayer. This is where the prayer begins. So we just now have gotten to it. We've been leading up to it. Now, he had made mention of, in what verse did he mention that he's going to be praying? Three. Verses 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how long is this prayer? Verses 9 through 11. Not a very long prayer. In fact, most of the prayers in Scripture are pretty short. Number three, does Paul use the same term for prayer in verse 9 as he did in verse 4? No, he does not. Here he's using the common word for prayer, which include, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to thank God, I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to pray for myself, I'm going to make requests, I'm going to make intercession, I'm going to make confession of my sins, all this is involved in the prayer that he uses here. Now, what two things does Paul pray for in this prayer? Well, in this verse, he prays that their love will abound to make them discerning. And in the next verse, he's going to add, uh, he's going to pray for their character, that they'll be pure and blameless. So let's get on with that. Number five, is he praying for their love as directed to God, as directed or as directed to one another? I think both. In fact, can you love God without loving one another? No. No, you cannot. Write down 1 John 3.17 for your answer. 1 John 3.17. 1 John 3.17 in essence is saying, you tell me you love me and you don't even like the person you're next to? Forget it. You don't love me at all. You cannot love me if you do not love your fellow man. Number six. Will Paul explain the reason for his praying that their love may abound still more? Yes, he will, later on in this letter. We're going to see why he is so em uh, emphatic that uh, their love be expressed in a very meaningful and positive way. Number seven, what would genuine love produce? Knowledge and discernment. That's right, knowledge and discernment. Folks, listen. My knowledge of God is directly proportionate to my seeking to know God better. And my way of growing in my knowledge of God is going to come through the study of God's Word. Now, I, I know that I, I shouldn't say this. Somebody else can say it more effectively than I can. But I'm going to say it anyhow. I look forward to Sunday morning. I doubt that there's been a single Sunday that I've listened to the preacher preach a sermon that he's not shared some insights. I thought, wow, where have I been? Now, folks, that just makes me so happy, so filled with joy. And the more I gain these additional insights, through somebody else and I've been reading these passages all my life and teaching and preaching all my life and I'm still learning is my knowledge increasing yes should that have any effect upon my discerning yes I, I just you know I have to ask God to give me a lot of patience because there are so many things I want to talk about this discernment do I ask a question about that? I don't know. Uh, let me go on and take the next two or three questions. Uh, I think I'll come to it maybe. I don't know. Uh, number eight, Paul prays that the Philippians increasingly may be persons characterized by love. Is this prayer answered? If this prayer is answered, who will the Philippians be like? Yes, like the Lord. God, like the Lord Christ. Paul uses the term abound 26 out of the 39 times it appears in the New Testament. 
By the way, have you noticed how many times I've asked that kind of question? How many times Paul used the word? You know, one of the ways that we can be pretty sure that we know who the author is, every one of us has our own vocabulary. You know that? Uh, somebody will say, who was that talked to me the other day? Well, tell me something he said. Then they'll quote him. Think, oh, that word? I don't know who you're talking about. He's the only one that ever uses that word. You know. And Paul just gives himself away because he has his own vocabulary. And he uses words, some of these words, a lot more than other people do. Uh, what is meant by abound as it relates to love? Overflowing. Overflowing, that's right. Beyond measure. It's more than you can possibly imagine. Now, what is implied in the phrase, still more? In other words, there's room for growth. We never quite arrive. Now, what indicates that Paul expects their love to be a discriminating love? Because he says, in knowledge and discernment. So the meaning of knowledge and discernment, number 12, uh, the knowledge is an awareness of what God wants us to know, and the discernment is an ability to use that knowledge to make right decisions. Now, uh, I've got to stop, but let me just make a few more comments here. Folks, there is a reason why we don't all behave the same way. There are some things that you think are so important, and somebody else, very fine person, doesn't see them nearly as important as you do. And there's some things you believe are right and other people think, I don't see anything wrong about that. I, I don't see anything right about that. Some things you believe are wrong and they say, I don't see anything wrong about that. Do you realize, I don't care who it is, is among us, our ability to discern between what is right and what is wrong, between what is good and what is better, between what is better and what is best, is based upon the knowledge we have of God. Now, think about this for just a moment. I, I just, I'm going to use a personal illustration again. I used too many of them. But as a little fella, I was playing on the floor. So I was a little fella. <laughs> playing with my cousin Charles. And it was getting late in the evening, and Charles' mother said, Charles, pick up your toys now. It's bedtime. And I knew that Charles was going to start picking up the toys. But he didn't. I said, hey, Charles, your mother said, pick up those toys. You know what Charles said? She doesn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? He was right. <laughs> Four more times I've seen him. Charles, pick up your toys. Charles, I said, pick up your toys. He never did. Did Charles know his mother better than I did? Sure did. If my mother had said that, my toys were going to be picked up right away. <laughs> or I was going to feel it all the way to the bed. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Father in heaven, help us to be discerning. Help us to know you so well that we'll not do just what is good. Not just what is better. But God, help us to live that kind of life that removes all doubt in the minds of others of who we really belong to, of which family we really are a member of. May your son Jesus live all over again in each one of us. I pray in Jesus' name.